It's morning rush hour in the Bronx, and in this poorest of New York's five boroughs, one of its richest men is out pressing the flesh. Stop and say hello to Mike Bloomberg. He's running for mayor. Say hello to Mike Bloomberg. He's running for mayor of New York. Morning, Mike Bloomberg. For low-income earners here, it's a fleeting encounter with the five billion dollar man. You know, the job is to get known and then to have people know what you stand for. Most people at 59 would be content with having built a business empire that spans the globe. Yet strange as it seems, Michael Bloomberg's ambition now is the top job at City Hall. That's the best you can do? You can do better than that. Why would a multi-billionaire like you want to stand on a street corner in the early morning in the Bronx and want to be mayor of this town. Why? Because it's the greatest city in the world and the opportunity to lead it and to make a difference and to do things that everybody says can't be done, it's just too much to pass up. Having made your billions, what some of your critics are saying is that... I have critics? I yeah, can't believe you, that. You do have some. Oh, I'm shocked. Uh, <laughs> but some of them say that um, essentially you want this job rather like somebody wants a private jet or a new yacht. What do you say to that child? Um, can I just remind you, when you were with me up in the Bronx uh, early in the morning, um, I'm hardly treating it frivolously. I'm working roughly uh, all my waking hours, seven days a week. Um, but the, that's the cost of having the opportunity to really change the world. And I think uh, if all of us sit around and just take the easy road, uh, society's not better off. Good morning. Nice to see you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to be the mayor of the city of New York, and uh, I think one of the reasons why it's such a great job is if you can solve the problem here, then uh, the rest of the world will uh, be able to follow if they want. Good morning. Mike Lumberg. Nice to see you. Thank you very much. You too. Well, New York is special, different than any other uh, city uh, in the world um, because of the diversity of our people. We have the sons and daughters of every uh, country in the world and every state in the Union. They all come here. And we get the best. We get the adventuresome. We get the ones uh, uh, who want to make it. If you've been here for six months and you find that you walk faster, you talk faster, you think faster, you're a New Yorker. <laughs> of all the people that I knew as president, Reagan was the best, the nicest. I loved him and I never voted for him. Really? Never voted for him, but I loved him. Yeah, what well, is a guy? Yeah, he's yeah. a wonderful human being. I to understand be why Michael Bloomberg the wants the job of mayor, uh, you need so only visit someone been who's been already been, been there, been the legendary been, Ed Koch, uh, who as a Democrat uh, ruled been, City Hall been, for 12 years. Looking around your room, it's extraordinary, right? When you're the mayor of New York, it yeah. seems, you're a celebrity because you're the mayor of the capital of the world. That's true. Absolutely true. I... I said to people, you know, you didn't have to pay me to take this job. I'd have paid you. <laughs> but I loved it. You were given this opportunity. I happen to believe in God. Uh, you don't have to if you don't want to. But I believe in uh, God. What a great opportunity he gave me. And I'm going to respond with every fiber in my body. Mm. And, and it's no wonder that somebody like Bloomberg would want this job because it's a gas. Yeah, I mean, it is, there's nothing like it. And then Mother Teresa came, I call this uh, my Catholic wall over here, uh, because uh, not only was she uh, wonderful, but she sent me a couple of notes, and so uh, I tell people, if you 
are nice to me, I'll let you touch the notes. <laughs> <laughs> to bring you good luck. Right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you should get Bloomberg yeah. round, yeah? Right. Hi, fellas. This is Hi, Michael Bloomberg. Let's give him a round of applause. Come on. Come on. Mike Bloomberg needs all the luck he can get. He's been a lifelong Democrat, but switched to the Republican Party for this contest in what he concedes was an act of blatant self-interest. The Democrats had four candidates there already. I certainly would not have had an opportunity to run as a Democrat. And since the Republicans asked me, and I agreed with the, their fiscal conservatism in the city, and they believe in good government, and uh, our current mayor is a Republican who is pro-choice, which I am, is against the death penalty, which I am, is in favor of gun control, which I am, is in favor of gay rights, which I am. I didn't have a, a, a moral or ethical or philosophical difference uh, with the Republican Party. And it's an opportunity to, to do, uh, to get to the public. Good morning, Mark Green, your Democrat for mayor. But the problem for Bloomberg is that New York is traditionally a Democrat town where registered Democrats outnumber Republicans by five to one. Sorry, Mark Green, Mark Green, Democrat for mayor. Hello, I'm Mark Green, how are you? The current mayor, Rudy Giuliani, is a Republican, but it's an aberration, happening once every 30 years or so when a Democrat mayor stumbles badly, as in the case of Giuliani's predecessor, David Dinkins. The game under the Dinkins years was as follows. The police wouldn't bother the criminals, and the American Civil Liberties Union wouldn't bother the police. And everyone was happy except the people who live in New York. And what's it like now? Uh, we're at a record level in population. We're near record level in jobs. Uh, crime is at a 40-year low. Welfare is at a 40-year low. And what's interesting is police violence has declined even more rapidly than crime. And David, under David Dinkins, we had 41 murder kill, killings, not murders, but killings of civilians by police. Last year under Giuliani, who so reviled by left-wingers, we had 11. So by almost any standard, by almost any measurement, things have gotten much, much better in New York. But now that's happened, and Rudy Giuliani can't stand again because of term limits. The smart money isn't on a Republican replacement like Bloomberg, but on this man, Democrat frontrunner Mark Green. I, I admire Michael Bloomberg. I think he's smart. He's a great philanthropist. The chance that he will or should be the next mayor of New York is equal to the chance I will or should be the next chairman of Microsoft. Really? It doesn't work like that, and he'll find out. Right, so this is an unrealistic bid on his part. Sure. Everybody's got a right to their opinions. Um, uh, he has not uh, run city government, nor has he run a company. So, to the best of my knowledge, he's never run anything. When he spoke with me about uh, close to a year ago as to whether or not he should run, I said, you'll lose. And then I had another uh, call from him six months later, and I said, you have a chance, because the uh, Democrats are so lackluster, uh, they're not taking off. So and you he, think he has got a he chance? He has a chance. He's still way behind, but he's got a chance. And. He can only win, in my judgment, and I've told him this, uh, if he comes up with solutions that are different by virtue of uh, his business background and brilliance as an entrepreneur. What about a high five? Giuliani yeah, That's the best you can do? That's the best you can do? <laughs> but for other New York legends, like the Daily News columnist Jimmy Breslin, Brilliant businessmen don't necessarily make brilliant politicians. In Bensonhurst in Brooklyn, where you're going to have to go to get the votes because there's a, an assembly district over there votes as heavily as any place in the world. Now, you're going to have to go get votes here. You're going to tell them you got the financial news service, Bloomberg. Why? Well, well, what is it? It's a thing, you know, and that's it. <laughs> tell me about, you know, hospital reaction time by ambulances if my mother, she's 90, gets sick. And then there's that Australian-born New York legend, the incorrigible Steve Dunleavy of the New York Post, self-acknowledged legend in his own lunchtime and avid Bloomberg fan. In the case of Bloomberg, here is this billionaire, and uh, if I was Bloomberg, I'd just stay being a billionaire and loving it. But if he really believes that he can be mayor, I wish he would become the mayor, 
but I think his chances are minuscule. I'd like a rich guy. I'd like a rich priest, a rich policeman, and a rich politician. So I wouldn't be worried about where they're getting the next buck. Right, because that's the recipe for incorruptibility. Is that what you're suggesting? I think it is a recipe for incorruptibility. Be rich. Right, he only wants a buck a year to do the job. Only a buck a year. How do you feel about extending SCREE to people with disabilities? Our SCREE is the senior citizen grant increase exemption. I'm not sure that I've seen that. I noticed on that street corner the chasm between exactly your lifestyle and the lifestyles sure. of the people you were meeting there. What do you think you've got in common with the poor of this city? Well, number one, I came from a family that didn't have any money. I came to New York in 1966 with some debts and a dream. And I don't want to overplay the poor beginnings, but I wasn't wealthy and. I lived hand to mouth. Uh, there are always, there's always somebody that lived poorer than you, but mm. have a good feel. Right, so you do have empathy with these people. You understand their asp aspirations. Absolutely, I yeah. think so. Now, I remember when I grew up and we used to hang out in the north end of Boston, it's a big Italian district, and there was uh, Elliot Ness, what was that? Untouchables. Untouchables on Wednesday night, and the streets literally be clear, and everybody's windows <laughs> open in the summer, and you could see that's what everybody was They're watching. watching right? And you could that's just listen true. to it as you walk down the street. <laughs> that's that's a great problem. Yeah, that was. I had to give it out all. 59, born in 42. Michael Bloomberg came from a modest Jewish background, the son of a bookkeeper who died of heart failure, but whose mother watched proudly as he became an Eagle Scout, the ultimate American boyhood accolade, and got through college on a national defense loan. He made a small fortune on Wall Street, but in 1981 was retrenched from Salomon Brothers and turned his severance check for $10 million into a big fortune, the financial news empire that bears his name. He's an enormously uh, successful businessman who understood the market for business information at a time when other people didn't. He created the Bloomberg box, which is this dedicated box to the stock market news. It's on every stock trader's desk. All, all, the comp all the shifts in stocks updated constantly. But he's a man whose experience in life is limited the financial, the financial world and financial information. Bloomberg's world headquarters on Park Avenue sets the standard for its other operations in more than 100 countries, encompassing not just the Bloomberg box, but a global radio and television network. Phil Gregory with Bloomberg's top business stories. The dollar... In exchange for absolute devotion to the job and an obsession with accuracy, Bloomberg both pays and pampers his 7,200 employees. The thing that really strikes me as, as a humble scribe, a uh, journalist, is the luxury. All journalists have reason to be humble, I find out. <laughs> they work very hard and they deserve it. And they're very honest and very confident. It's not just the fish tanks, but the endless supply of free snacks that's the envy of the industry. I think his attitude is, if they leave the building to go out to lunch, there's a very fair chance one hour becomes an hour and a half, and they may have a few gargles, and who knows? It's just a, another nice ways to make the environment more conducive to you wanting to be there. If you are an employee of the company and you want to come in every day, you want to come in early and you want to work hard and you want to stay late and you take great pride in what you do, then the company benefits and so do you. While there's nothing new about this form of social contract, Bloomberg takes it a step further, arguing that the rich have an obligation not just to their workers, but to use their fortunes for the common good. Well, I, I don't know what I'm worth, but uh, I, I do give a lot of money away. I'm a big believer that, uh, uh, from a very selfish point of view, there's nothing I can do with my money that would give me as much pleasure as maybe curing a disease or educating kids or helping uh, people enjoy uh, our culture. Do you think other billionaires do enough in the community? 
Well, I was a big critic, for example, of Bill Gates for a long time because he didn't give away, and lately I've become his biggest fan. Uh, over the last few years, he has uh, become the most generous human being in the history of the world, even in current dollars. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Ted Turner, uh, who gave a billion dollars to the UN. I'm a big fan of George Soros. Uh, philanth private philanthropy is a very American tradition, and uh, it's one of the things that I think lets America hold its head up. Uh, and sort of uh, say we're better than everybody else. I really believe that. Along with the flag, mom and apple pie, public service is also rated highly in America. And as Bloomberg tells it, his tilt at the mayor's job is largely altruistic. To apply the skills he acquired in business to serve the people of New York. The city's eight million people are scattered over five very different boroughs. Here on Staten Island, there's a small town feel. In Brooklyn and Queens, large swathes of leafy suburbia. And then the Bronx and Manhattan with its landmark skyline that conjures up New York in the mind's eye of the whole world. Michael Bloomberg is casting himself as CEO of the Big Apple and its 250,000 municipal employees. Well, uh, running a quarter of a million people in the public world is different than running 7,200 people in the private world, but at least I have some experience. I deal with governments in 125 different countries where we do business, or the roughly 100 where we have offices. There are people to lead. There are people you're trying to help that you have to listen to in dialogue. Uh, there are management issues, and there's being accountable. Bob McGuire said to me, tell me a great story. He used to have these signs in car windows eight years ago, no radio, nothing in trunk. And he came out one day and there was a car in front of his apartment building and somebody had smashed in the window, taken the sign and wrote on it, there should be. <laughs> Only in New York. Only in New York. His critics say the biggest problem is he's got no concept whatsoever of public administration. Is that fair criticism? I think a better, uh, no. I will tell you that's not fair criticism, uh, because when I ran, they said, what's he ever managed? I mean, he's been a congressman. He's managed 18 people. He has 250,000 people who work for the city. How's he going to do it? And I did it, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, managerial um, abilities are genetic. You either have it or you don't have it, and he has it. What Bloomberg would inherit should he win is the quantum leap in the general tenor of New York under the outgoing mayor, Rudy Giuliani, an extraordinarily divisive figure who provokes loathing and admiration in equal measure. Rudy Giuliani is a miserable human being. You would not want him as a neighbor. However, what's interesting is in 1993, the political class of New York, left, right, and center said, you can't reduce crime, you can't improve the City University of New York, you can't reduce welfare. He did all three. And he did it in part because he didn't listen to the political class of the city. So what's my difference? Change the kind of policing was known. By doubling the police force and getting tough in the courts, Giuliani reclaimed the streets for law abiding New Yorkers and rejuvenated areas like Brooklyn. So sedate now that resident Fred Siegel can scarcely believe the transformation. 1992, 1993, there was a sense of panic in New York. I live, this, I, I live here in a beautiful area, Victorian Flatbush, large, one and two family homes, very integrated. The mood was, get out. We had, we had to organize a civilian patrol. I walked on these blocks three nights a week because my wife had gotten mugged. Uh, I was, my kids had bicycles stolen out right from under them. Two blocks away, there was an open-air, 24-hour crack market. Open-air, 24-hour crack market. In between my house and the crack market, there were police who were cooping, sleeping in the cars. And what's it like now? My neighborhood is lovely. Uh, this is still a highly integrated neighborhood of all, all, sorts, of, all sorts of people. It's pl life is very pleasant here. The fear is that after Giuliani, uh, we'll return to, to the previous conditions.
So Giuliani's legacy is a safer city, more comfortable with itself. But like the place itself, Rudy has had his own dark underbelly, castigating minorities and turning on even his strongest supporters. It was Ed Kosher's endorsement that got Giuliani the job, but then came a major falling out when Giuliani politicized the judiciary. Well, uh, he's been a good mayor, but he's a terrible person. And he's mean, and uh, once you don't agree with him, you become his uh, mortal enemy from his point of view. He then in attacked my integrity, falsely, falsely. How did you feel about uh, being attacked by the guy you'd got over the line? Well, I said, I'll get you, you prick. Rudy Giuliani's wife doubtless feels the same, for he's caught in a love triangle that's the talk of New York, the wife holed up in Gracie Mansion, the mayoral residence refusing to leave, while Giuliani steps out with his mistress. It's a real-life soap opera to rival Sex and the City, but seems to play well here in stark contrast to more judgmental parts of America, something his would-be replacement may appreciate. Much is made here of your single uh, man about town oh. uh, status. Um, uh, indeed, you once described your life as a, as a wet dream. Um, uh, I saw that in the paper. I'm not sure I said that. But it does sound good. Um, suffice it to say, I was uh, uh, very happily married to a wonderful woman for 19 years. We have two children together. Uh, she is still one of my best friends. Uh, but I've been divorced for... Uh, seven or eight years, and uh, uh, I lead an active social life would be a nice way to phrase it. He has been seen with some very, very beautiful ladies. Uh, whether he's a ladies' man, uh, I think that probably is stretching credibility. Mm. Uh, although, if you're a billionaire, you, you look very attractive. Well, he, uh, he has been accused of womanizing. Uh, and when he's uh, responded to that, and he said, listen, uh, I am single. I mean, he had been married. He has children. Uh, and uh, I'm heterosexual, uh, and I'm having a good time. Uh, that may play. Well, after Clinton and after Giuliani in trouble and has, has to leave the mayor's house at Gracie Mansion because uh, he's having fights with his wife. Uh, after things like that, uh, Giuliani going parading in front of, uh, on Fifth Avenue, he's calling for new morality in New York City and he's walking with his girlfriend while his wife and two kids are home. He's a, a freaking adulterer in front of the Cardinal walking proudly. I mean, after this, what, Blumberg's going to say, I'm single, I've had a lot of girlfriends. Good, but I mean, now tell me what you're going to do about the garbage in Brooklyn. After Giuliani, what many New Yorkers do want is a change of tone. Another Mr. Meany, perhaps, but with a softer side. Would you be as confrontational as, as he has been? Has Rudy been confrontational? I'm he sure sh has. I, I'm <laughs> shocked. I didn't see any of that. But would you? Or would you be seeking more consensus? Um, I'm not a believer in seeking consensus. I am a believer in consulting with lots of people, uh, letting them know that I'm listening, that their input is in, but then um, I'm a believer in the guy at the top or the woman at the top uh, uh, making a decision and then everybody gets on board. Right, a conviction politician. Um, I, I hadn't heard that term before, but sure. <laughs> Now that New Yorkers feel more secure in their surroundings, Mike Bloomberg wants to build on Giuliani's legacy with big initiatives on housing and education. He's targeting the public school system in particular for a major shake-up, saying teachers like the police have to be made more accountable. You, the principal, take responsibility for your school and your teachers, and then you give them an incentive. You give them merit pay per school if they do a good job, and if they don't, you say to the principal, why didn't you? What can we do to help? 
but if you haven't fixed it after a while, we are just going to have to move you someplace else and bring in somebody that can make the schools work for the kids rather than for the system. Hi, Mike Gornberg, running for mayor. Commendable as it may be, this isn't the stuff of headlines. And Bloomberg shares the perennial frustration of politicians the world over in trying to highlight policy and good outcomes when all people really want to know about is his love life. Well, listen, there are... I noticed there's actually a lady uh, lurking in the background uh, as we're following you around. Um, without being impertinent, can I ask if this is a serious one? Um, it depends who's going to see this television program, how I answer that. <laughs> Wet dream or not, it seems a fabulous life and a fabulous story. The poor Jewish boy who comes to New York and makes good, builds a global media empire, earns a great fortune, and then starts sharing his largesse through charitable works, culminating in the pursuit of public office. Despite the lofty sentiments, not all men here are created equal. Yet one thing is certain. With his billions, Michael Bloomberg isn't in politics for the money. Just turn on the schmaltz and look at his face. This guy really believes in the American dream. I'm going to run in the Republican primary and hopefully get through that and run in the general election. But what I'm going to do is pay for the campaign myself so that I'm not responsible to anybody else other than to the voters. The buck is going to stop with me, and I'm going to do my best to deliver, and I would appreciate your consideration.